It's a pleasure to follow Baroness Butler Sloss and Judge Prince. They've outlined the provisions of the Modern Slavery Act. My purpose is not to address what is in the Act, but rather the need to have in place a means of evaluating legislative measures once enacted that is particularly salient in the case of the Modern Slavery Act. We cannot tackle modern slavery without a legal base. You, as judges, cannot act without such a base. Prosecutors can only prosecute what is prohibited by law. You depend on the law being fit for purpose. Legislators seek to give effect to what they want to achieve through the words of a legislative act, but they cannot know for certain what effect the measure will have. There may be a problem of interpretation if the language is couched in general rather than specific terms. As one distinguished British judge, Lord Roger Bills Ferry, observed, if Parliament states the principles, principles behind the legislation in general terms, the courts might not always be able to interpret those principles so clearly as to determine with precision and consistency which cases should be held to fall within and which fall outside its scope. Some measures do not work out as intended. The meaning may be benign, but the wording may be deficient. Some measures may prove disastrous. Others may simply have little or no effect. Even if the wording is clear, there may be problems with resources for enforcement. As the introductory text to this summit observed, one question without an adequate answer that keeps coming up in our meetings is how many human traffickers, pimps and drug traffickers are caught and how many ill-gotten gains have been confiscated and directed towards former victims in society. To be apprehended and have ill-gotten gains confiscated, there has to be a legal base. But that legal base needs to be precise, and the extent to which the law achieves what it is intended to needs to be assessed. A United Kingdom Act passed in 2000, the Powers of Criminal Court Sentencing Act, made it possible to provide reparation to victims. But the number of reparation orders made in human trafficking and slavery cases by 2015 was low. On the face of it, the Act was not achieving what legislators intended it to achieve. For many legislators, and this has certainly tended to be the case in the United Kingdom, success in legislative terms has been measured in terms of getting a measure onto the statute book. The success is getting it passed. It is not measured in terms of whether it achieves what it is intended to achieve. The legislative process has thus tended to end with raw assent being given to a bill. Now, this has changed in recent years with recognition that measures do need to be assessed once they are in force. There has thus been some move to look at implementation, indeed to see the legislative process as more than the deliberation and assent accorded to a measure by the legislature and to view it instead as a holistic process, essentially a three-stage process. The pre-legislative, the legislative, and the post-legislative stages. There has been attention given to looking at measures in draft before they're formally submitted to Parliament, and to assessing whether they have achieved their purpose when they are in force. This more holistic approach has applied especially in respect of the Modern Slavery Act enacted last year. As John McEldowney said in his opening comments to the summit, and Baroness Butler Sloss has reiterated, the Act is the first of its kind in Europe. Given that the Act is the first of its kind, it is especially important to ensure that it achieves what it is intended to achieve. There are two problems particular to this measure. First, the very fact that it is the first of its kind. If the Act is to be an exemplar, we need to get it right, but we have nothing against which to test it. Secondly, the nature of the problem makes it difficult to assess the effectiveness of the measure. As the impact assessment for the Modern Slavery Bill noted, modern slavery is a largely hidden crime. 
as we've heard, there's the difficulty of defining the subject, and no way of knowing the full extent of the problem. We can get fairly objective data on crimes like murder, but for the extent of modern slavery, we rely on estimates, depending, of course, on how we define modern slavery and what, therefore, constitutes an offence. It is crucial, therefore, to evaluate the effects of the Act once it's had an opportunity to bed it. To quote the impact assessment again, modern slavery requires a clear focus from government through both legislative and non-legislative measures to ensure an effective response. But how do we know if the response has been effective? The policy objective of the Modern Slavery Act is to reduce the incidence of human trafficking and modern slavery in the United Kingdom. The issue is not the objective, but determining whether it has been achieved. As Alan St. Saunders touched upon, is it to be measured in terms of an increase in prosecutions or in a decrease? As Home Secretary Theresa May said at the third reading of the Modern Slavery Bill, if it is to be implemented effectively, we need concerned, concerted effort from all those involved. Enactment, then, is a necessary but not sufficient condition. One of the motivations for the introduction of the bill was what was identified as an unduly lenient sentence regime. But what mechanism is in place to determine that the Modern Slavery Act is being enforced effectively, indeed that the provisions are clear and proving enforceable. Well, given the importance and complexity of the issue, the Modern Slavery Bill was preceded by an evidence-based study of the problem, and this was followed by pre-legislative scrutiny. <coughs> there was a Modern Slavery Bill evidence review panel chaired by a member of Parliament, Frank Field, who attended one of the previous Senate summits held here, which took evidence from experts ahead of publication of the bill. This was followed by an appointment of a joint committee of both Houses of Parliament to examine the draft bill. There was thus a dedicated and extended attempt to ensure that the bill was crafted effectively in order to address the mischief it was intended to address and indeed identify the mischief itself. The next step, now that the Act is on the statute book, is, as I say, to determine if it is achieving what it is intended to achieve. That's the key message I wish to convey. It's important not only to enact clear law to combat modern slavery, but also to put in place a mechanism for checking that it is achieving its purpose, and if it's not achieving its purpose, identifying what changes need to be made. In the United Kingdom, we have the mechanism now in the form of post-legislative review introduced in 2008. Under this, most Acts of Parliament are reviewed three to five years after enactment by the sponsoring government department to determine if they've achieved their intended purpose. The Modern Slavery Act will thus be reviewed sometime between 2018 and 2020 by the relevant government department, in this case the Home Office, and the review published. The post-legislative reviews undertaken by government departments are sent to the House of Commons to departmental select committees, that's permanent investigative committees, which may then choose to undertake their own inquiries in the light of the reviews. Because of competing demands on their time, few select committees undertake post-legislative reviews. However, the House of Lords, our second chamber, has begun a practice each year of selecting Acts of Parliament and appointing ad hoc committees to review them and assess whether they've achieved what they're intended to achieve. The House has had committees examining legislation, dealing with the adoption of children, public inquiries, mental health, extradition, and disability. The value of such inquiries is that they're thorough, each covers one parliamentary session in effect one year, result in published reports, embodying evidence and recommendations, are, and are undertaken by members of the House with particular experience and expertise relevant to the subject. For example, Baroness Butler Sloss, former president of the Family Division of the High Court, chaired the one on adoption. The Modern Slavery Act would be an ideal candidate 
for post legislative review by the House of Lords, and I would hope that the House will appoint such a committee once the Act has had time to take effect. This will complement the review undertaken by the Home Office and will enable the House of Lords to draw on experts in the field. It will be valuable not only to see how the, act, the first act of this kind, the Modern Slavery Act, is being implemented and the extent to which it is achieving its <coughs> intended goals and the extent to which it needs to be amended in the light of developments with modern slavery. However, my purpose is not primarily to draw attention to this eventuality, but rather to emphasise the importance of having in place a mechanism, a mechanism for review, ideally a regular review of law to combat modern slavery. To repeat my point, enacting law is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Is the law achieving what it is intended to achieve? How do you know if it is? What are the standards by which you are measuring success? Can the law be improved? I conclude by recommending not only that nations have in place mechanisms for assessing the effectiveness of laws against modern slavery, but also sharing with one another what those mechanisms are. Passing law to combat modern slavery is the start of the process to tackle the mischief. As is clear from this summit, it is not the end of the process. Thank you. <laughs>